Praise the Lord, everyone. Sean back with another video for you all. Um, I wanted to do a video about Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. And it seems I've, you know, seen some people like to use that passage as if you are someone who's saved and you, you, you mess up that. You know, maybe that means that you weren't saved or you, or you lose your salvation. And um, I just want to read this and then I just kind of want to go into it and, and kind of give what I believe that Jesus was saying here. So it says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. Many would say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So. I want to go up to verse 15. And this is Jesus talking, it says, beware of false prophets. So here we understand who Jesus is addressing, false prophets. He says, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bringeth forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Now, we have to understand that with Jesus, first of all, he was addressing false prophets. And he, he describes them as them wearing sheep's clothing, but inwardly being ravening wolves. So he was describing someone who on the outside looks like they are of the Lord, but on the inside, they are the total opposite. So this is also the same way that the Lord was how he was describing to the Pharisees about them being whitewashed tombs. They look nice on the outside, but on the inside, they're full of dry, dead bones. So it's, it's possible for someone to look like they are of God, but actually they are not of God. Now, he begins to use this this agricultural analogy of trees and he says how every good tree brings forth good fruit and how every evil tree brings forth evil fruit and how a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit and a corrupt tree cannot cannot bring forth good fruit. So I, I think people tend to key in on the part where it says how a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. And they make it such as, well, if you're saved and yet you still have some problems with sin and you still have some struggles that, you know, either you lost your salvation or you were never saved. Now, one thing I will say, the Bible says we should examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. So if if you do, we should all at some point step back and examine ourselves. That's what the Bible says. Um. You know, if you are going through something or a season in your life, it's good to step back and examine. Um, you know, now it doesn't automatically mean because you have struggles that that means you're not saved. But at the same time, you know, there it is possible to, to be a false convert. So either way, it's good just to do as the Bible says and examine ourselves. So Jesus Christ uses this analogy of a good uh, tree bringing forth good fruit and an evil tree bringing forth evil fruit. Okay, now let's look at another analogy similar to this. Matthew chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell on stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith, they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns 
and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some in a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Now the Lord Jesus Christ here in Matthew 13, he's talking about seeds. And if you will see, the seed is actually referring to the, the message, um, the word that is. And the soil refers, refers to the, the types of hearts of, of men or whoever is receiving the, the message. And he gives four different types of uh, scenarios. And the first three, we see that the seed was, was sown, but the seed never took root. But that last one, that seed was not only sown, it took root. Now, how do we know when, when something takes root, when a seed takes root in soil? Well, we start to see the fruit of that seed being produced coming out the soil. You know, if you plant a seed and you don't see anything growing, well, obviously that seed, for whatever reason, never took root. But if you plant something and you see fruit come out of it, your obvious connection is, well, that seed must have took root. How do you know? Because fruit is coming out of it. So we can see that in this same way, the analogy that Jesus Christ is using these trees these trees in this particular analogy is referring to people and the fruit is referring to the deeds and whether or not those deeds are made acceptable unto God or not. So when we see that a tree, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Well, what's going on here? Well, the Bible talks about people even either being a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. Now, Someone who is a slave to sin is someone who is not saved. So even if they do something that is relatively good to say they are helping people, they try to be kind and courteous and all that. Even though that's good, that thing, those things are still unacceptable unto God. Why? Because they are still dead in their trespasses. They are still dead in their sins. So their good works are made unacceptable. We have to understand that the Bible says that. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Understand it says our righteousness. But remember the Apostle Paul said, I would rather have the righteousness of Christ in me rather than my own righteousness that is found in the works of the law. So if our righteousness is as filthy rags and Paul says that he would rather have the righteousness of Christ, then we understand that someone that does something apart from Christ is dead in their sins. And therefore, whatever they do is sinful. Therefore, they are a slave to sin because they can't do anything but sin. Now, someone who is saved and and keep this in mind. Now, what we're talking about is salvate is the issue of salvation here, not maturity amongst a believer. But we're talking about whether you're saved or not. For someone who's saved, their entire life has been wiped clean, past, present, future. So from a standpoint of salvation, the Lord doesn't see your own, your own righteousness, which we know is his filthy rags. The Lord sees the righteousness of Christ in you. Therefore, from that standpoint, there is nothing you can do to tarnish that. Therefore, since you are saved, you're a good tree. And now that you're a good tree, every everything that you do that's obedient is going to be now is made acceptable unto God. Now that we're saved, now, now your works can be made acceptable unto God. So now anything that you do that is obedient towards God is now acceptable. Now, of course, if you are saved and you still do something disobedient, that thing is not made acceptable unto God, but that thing had already been atoned for and was wiped clean as white as snow the moment you received salvation. So we have to understand that someone who is a true believer, they can still sin, but that sin has already been atoned for and it does not cancel out their salvation. Okay, now, 
let's go to verse 21. And under, remember now, we're talking about false prophets here. Back up in verse 15, that's what Jesus was addressing, false prophets. So in verse 21, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So here you have Jesus Christ saying, listen, not everyone who addresses me as I actually am, because we do know, we understand Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So he's saying not everyone who addresses me, you know, properly address me for who I am will necessarily enter to the kingdom of heaven. He says, but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. So. What is the will of the father? Now, a lot of it seems like some people believe that. Well, the will of the father is to, you know, how Christ said, be holy as my father in heaven is holy. So they feel like, OK, let me do these works. Now, understand we are to do, the, you know, do good works. But a lot of times people don't understand they put the cart before the horse before you can do good works. As we just talked about, you have to be saved first to be made acceptable unto God for your works to be made acceptable to God. So. Since that's the case, what is the will of the father? Let's go to John chapter six, verse 40. This is Jesus talking. And this is the will of him that sent me. This is referring to the father. That everyone which seeth the son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So we see the will of the father is for us to be saved through the one who he sent. That being his son, Jesus Christ. Remember, only by only through the son can we can we get to the father. OK. Now look at second Thessalonians one and eight in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in this particular passage, um, this was referring to Jesus coming back to do battle with the Antichrist and all those who follow him. But still, nonetheless, this same parallel still applies the same way Jesus is going to take vengeance on the Antichrist and all those who follow. Ultimately, is the same thing that happens to all unbelievers. God is going to take vengeance on all those who die. Either you of you, either you are of the God, the father or of your father the devil so all those who don't accept christ they're going to god is going to take his fiery vengeance on so we can you know kind of put these these points together and we can see that you know the father wants us to come be reconciled back have us reconciled back to him through the son which brings me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So we see that the Father wants to reconcile man back to himself. How? By Jesus Christ. And how do we and how are we reconciled to God by Jesus Christ? It says by, in this case, it says that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So the opposite of that is to obey the opposite of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And what is the gospel? Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. That's the only way we can be saved is by what Christ did for us on that cross. So if you look at verse 22... It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? So here we have these same false prophets. And I believe it can, you know, honestly refer to anyone who is going to be panicking at this point, trying to give their reason why they don't they shouldn't be cast out. It says, they say, we prophesy, we cast out devils. We did all these wonderful works in our name. We don't understand. And in 23, Jesus says, and then I will profess unto them, 
I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So here you have people that are actually doing what it seemed like was the will of the Father. But we see that that was never the case. Why? Because they're being cast out. And we see that the only way that they can be reconciled to God is how? Through belief on the Son. So all of these things that they were doing, they really either they really weren't doing or if they were doing something supernaturally. They were doing it not by God's holy power, but by evil power. In, in, in any case, they were not actually true believers and doing things um, by the power of God. So. If we look at. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 13, it says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So here it's almost like you have these people pleading their case. Lord, we did this. Lord, we did that. I don't understand. But if we just read in Second Timothy three, 13, it says you have people who are wax worse and worse, deceived and being deceived. Not only are they deceiving others, they themselves are being deceived. It's almost like. They were in their perversion for so long that now they have started to believe their own lies, their own perversions, and no one can tell them any any different. So, you know, so ultimately Jesus says, I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, understand, Jesus Christ says, I never knew you. So this isn't about being able to lose salvation. There's not someone who had it and lost it because Jesus Christ said, I never knew you. Now we understand Jesus Christ knows all. So obviously this is not about Christ not knowing or lacking knowledge. This is referring to someone never having been saved. Let's look at John chapter 10, verse 27 through 28. It says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So we actually see here that it says his sheep hear my voice, and it says, and I know them. And he says that he's going to give them eternal life. So if God knows you, that means you're of his fold, you're his sheep, and he's going to give you eternal life. And it says no man will pluck you out of his hand. But if he doesn't know you, like we see here in Matthew 7, 23, he says, I never knew you depart from me. So these false prophets, as well as anyone else who doesn't obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they're going to be cast out. So, you know, I just want to make this video and I just want people to understand that, you know, we should examine ourselves as the Bible says we should. But I just want to let people know that this is not about if you are saved, but you do something wrong or you have seasons where you struggle, that that just automatically cancels out your salvation. Nothing can cancel your salvation. If it could, you would never you would never have had it in the first place. That's grace. Getting something when you don't deserve it. So when people are talking about having uh, being a good tree and, and, and not being able to produce bad fruit, you know, understand what that's talking about. That's talking about unsaved versus saved. And if you're not saved, you can you can only do bring forth evil fruit. But if you're saved. You can only bring forth good fruit. Why? Because all of that evil, sinful things had already been atoned for. And, and God only sees the righteousness of Christ in you at that point. He doesn't see your own righteousness. He sees the righteousness of Christ in you. Now, there, now there is a whole other topic about believers having their own judgment. And if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you will see how all believers will be at the judgment seat of Christ and all of our works will be manifested and tried by fire and all those things which abide in the fire will get a reward. But all those things which are burnt up 
we'll lose out on that reward, but it says we will be saved. So the Lord, it's not like the Lord is just oblivious, but from, from a salvation standpoint, the Lord doesn't see that it's been wiped away clean, but for receiving rewards at that point, all of those things we manifested. So I just wanted to make this video for you all. And I pray that first and foremost, God got the glory out of it. And I pray that this helps anybody who may be seeing this video. If you felt led to share it, comment, but until next time, I love you all. God bless.